On the show this week, I'm talking all about a cat who is leaking on himself after suffering from a urethral obstruction, a bladder obstruction. And then I'm moving on to a male chihuahua who has a reduced appetite, seems to be in pain and has a hard, tense stomach. We're talking about what could be causing that and the treatment that may be needed. But before we get into all of those things, here's the intro. Welcome to Call the Vet, the show that answers all your dog and cat questions so they can live healthier, happier lives. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hi, I'm Dr. Alex, the veterinarian behind rpetshealth.com, and welcome to the 31st episode of the Call the Vet podcast, the show where I take your questions and give you the answers that you need so that you can look after your pet to the best of your ability. So whatever questions you've got, whether it's how to look after them and keep them healthy, if they're feeling under the weather, if they're not well and you want to know what could be causing the problem or how to best treat them, whatever it is, if you just head over to callthevet.org, you can get your question answered answered in an upcoming episode. So definitely head over there. And if you head over to that site, callthevet.org, you'll also find all of the show notes to to this podcast episode, as well as the back catalogue of podcasts. Also, if you're a new listener and you do enjoy the show, then make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any future episodes. And for those of you who have listened before and enjoy what you hear, I'd appreciate it so much if you could head over to ourpetshealth.com slash review and leave me a review for the show. It helps more than you can imagine with other people discovering this podcast podcast and knowing that it's something worth their time listening to. So that's it for me with the intro. Let's jump into the first question. And the first question is from Jamila, who writes, my cat won't stop leaking after a vet appointment because of a urethral obstruction. Can you please help? How can I stop him from leaking on himself? So I've had quite a few questions about um, cystitis in cats and spraying and that kind of thing. But this is a, a first. So it's a great question, Jamila. And really the things that spring to mind is that actually I would definitely recommend that you take your cat back to check that the bladder is emptying properly. So uh, if you're not already if you're not already aware, a urethral obstruction is a problem that generally happens because of an inflammation within the bladder, although there are a number of causes of those. And I'll come on to those a little bit later. But what happens is the tube between the bladder and the outside world, so the urethra, becomes blocked. It develops an obstruction, which is then a fatal, a potentially fatal condition. Certainly it is fatal if it's left untreated because the urine cannot escape from the bladder. The bladder gets bigger and bigger. The toxins build up and ultimately those toxins are fatal. It causes all kinds of different problems within the body that that result in yeah all manner of different ways that unfortunately a cat gets more and more unwell and will pass away. So it's an incredibly serious condition and you know it's not one that we want to, to be messing around with. The other thing about a urethral obstruction is that the, for any cat that has had one, there is a small or a reasonable chance of developing a repeat obstruction uh, after that episode has been cleared. So it's something like, um, I think it's kind of 5 to 10% of cats will become obstructed uh, within about 24 hours of of going home. And within a month, it's up to even about 25%. Now, I think those figures are higher than maybe the real world uh incidence is because we are able to deal with this condition we're managing this condition a lot better than we were in the past but it just serves to highlight that there is a risk of reobstruction, and we want to make sure that that isn't a problem that is developing again in Jamila's cat so there's a couple of things that we we that might be going on uh, for a cat who is constantly leaking urine after having a, a urethral obstruction and the first one is that the um, the bladder might actually not be emptying properly. Now that might sound silly. You might be thinking, well, if if your cat's leaking urine, surely the bladder is emptying, and the problem is it's emptying too much. But actually, what can happen is if the bladder has been full and become very very full and stretched for a reasonable length of time, and that can happen in a an obstruction depending on how long that's been going on for before it's been picked up and before that uh, urethral obstruction has been cleared. But yeah, a cat with a blocked bladder, they can have a really big bladder. And what then happens is even when you clear the infection, all the muscles and, and um, the bladder wall has been stretched and stretched and stretched. And then it can't 
actually contract and empty as it normally would, even after that obstruction is cleared. If you imagine it like a um, a balloon, if you get a balloon, you blow it up as as far as you can, as as hard as big as you can before um, it bursts. And if you actually leave it like that for a number of days, when you let that balloon down, it doesn't go back to being the size that it was originally. It it, it becomes bigger and and floppier, and that's a little bit like what a bladder can become after it's become really f- very full. Now, what happens here because the cat isn't able to empty the bladder properly. Unfortunately, then the bladder again becomes very full, even when there isn't a an obstruction present. As the bladder becomes full of urine, then the pressure of the urine inside the bladder starts to rise and rise. And then eventually, once the bladder is very full, the urine then drips out constantly as that pressure kind of is higher than the resistance to flow. So we call this actually a a retention overflow. The bladder is very big and the urine is just dripping out very slowly, but constantly as well. So if a cat is leaking constantly, then this would definitely be a concern. Uh, We can get this in other other conditions. So for example, if a cat has had um, what we would call a tail pull injury, so that's if their tail has been pulled because it's been trapped in a a door or, um, you know, caught under a wheel or something like that then it can they can get a similar problem where they they can't urinate the the nerve supply to the bladder isn't functioning properly and so they're not able to contract that bladder as they normally would and then the urine builds up and then you get this drip 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 of urine all the time once it's full so that's certainly one thing that can be a a problem after an obstruction and it's obviously definitely something that you need to uh, be aware of and to to consider treatment for if it is there that's going to be relatively easy for your vet to determine if that's the case or not they're going to feel a very full bladder in your in your cat's abdomen but when they squeeze that bladder they're going to be able to express it because the other thing we can do is if there is a, a a partial obstruction if there's they're not quite completely obstructed but they're nearly there then it might be that only a very small amount of urine is able to to get around that small obstruction so what would happen there is if your vet was um, vet was trying to express the bladder manually and they weren't able to do that effectively then that would suggest that there might be a partial obstruction present now if your cat does have this retention overflow problem the general treatment for that is to just to keep the bladder very empty for a number of days to allow everything to recover, to allow those muscles to to recover from that excessive stretch, and generally it settles down quite quite nicely. There was a drug that um, we used to use, um, something called bethanicol, to to help with this, but I think the availability of that is um, is not very good. I certainly, w- w- when I've been trying to get hold of that drug, I've not been able to get hold of it, so I'm not sure it is a human drug. So I'm not sure if it's actually been been discontinued or not. But there were other drugs that we could use, and alternatively, it might be if your cat really doesn't like having their bladder expressed and that that certainly can happen because it can be pretty uncomfortable for a cat uh, to have that problem going on anyway but also to have their their abdomen and their bladder to be squeezed you know three or four or five times a day ideally then it might be that they need to have another catheter popped into their bladder just to help keep the urine um, out of the bladder so that it's nice and small and can recover now the other alternative to a cat who's leaking all the time is that actually they're just producing an awful lot of urine and they just need to go all the time and if they're trapped somewhere or if they're shut somewhere that's away from their litter tray or they can't go outside because you're wanting to keep an eye on them closely then they just kind of have accidents if you like and this can happen especially after an obstruction because uh a a cat can produce an awful lot of urine so it has an effect on the kidneys kind of that increase in pressure in the bladder has a knock-on effect on the kidneys which means that uh, for some for a period of time they may lose the ability to concentrate the urine as well as they normally would now that manifests itself as a cat who is producing an awful lot of urine and like I say may well um, yeah may well be having accidents now that is a problem that assuming that everything else is fine that the the underlying problem has been correct um this excessive urine production should sort itself out in a few days all being well although you know the the only care really that needs to be taken is that the um that your cat isn't becoming dehydrated because if they're producing an awful lot of urine they're going to need to also be taking in a lot of water even either with their food or by getting them to drink more and again that's something i'm going to come on to in a little bit um just to to stop them becoming dehydrated which can then cause all kinds of problems in itself now i did get a follow 
follow-up question from Jamila. But at this point, I just wanted to remind you to bear in mind that I don't know your pet personally. And so the information that I give in these podcasts is only a guide and not specific advice for any individual dog or cat. Always check in with your vet if your pet has any health concerns. And so this follow-up question was, um, my cat has stopped leaking today which is clearly great. And he looks healthier. I'm glad. But he still goes to the toilet a lot. What can I do to avoid such a problem again? Should I change his diet? He's been drinking a lot of water lately. So at this point, it's worthwhile just running quickly through the causes of a blocked bladder, a urethral obstruction, whatever it is that you you call it, because that's going to impact what we do to, to treat the condition, but also how we can go about preventing it. So there are a number of different causes that can cause a cat to have problems urinating or to cause their, their urethra to actually become blocked. Now, the most common one is a, a simple cystitis. Um, it's also known as feline lower urinary tract disease um, or idiopathic cystitis, FIC. There's lots of different names for um, the same condition or very similar conditions. And this is actually generally a stress-related condition that causes an inflammation within the bladder. You get a lot of mucus and debris that collects within the bladder and that all kind of congregates together to form uh, like a mucus plug that when it's tried to be tried to be passed in the urine it kind of gets part of the way and then becomes blocked now this is generally a problem uh, or it's pretty much solely a problem with male cats rather than female cats and the reason for that is that their urethra is um, much narrower especially as it gets towards the end towards kind of the the, the tip of the penis it can become a lot narrower which means that a, a, a little plug is able to get part of the way down but then becomes stuck and causes a complete obstruction to that tube so the urine can't get through so that's really the most common cause of a blocked bladder in cats but there are other causes and they can include things like bladder stones so you can get actually stones that start growing within uh, within the bladder there's a number of different reasons that that might happen Um, and as well as just big stones you can also get like a sand like a sludge that then attempts to be passed in the urine but causes it but but similarly to that mucus plug it can't get all the way and it becomes stuck and blocks that tube a bladder infection can also cause uh, cause this problem again you get inflammation within the bladder you get all of those things building up and it causes an obstruction you can also have a bladder tumor now that causes a problem because the bladder tumors are often close to the exit of the bladder and by growing they can then occlude they can block the the exit of urine uh nerve damage is another reason why a cat can't pee so i already kind of touched on that when i was answering the first bit of the question that you can get nerve damage that that reduces the ability or completely eliminates the ability of a cat's bladder to contract now if that's the problem then you are likely to then get this retention overflow problem eventually it's maybe not quite so dangerous as a block bladder but equally it's very painful it's very uncomfortable and it can be clearly very serious nerve damage is something that if it does happen it's very difficult to predict how well the recovery is going to be now another thing that a cat kind of a cat if your cat's straining if they're having trouble peeing is um can be trauma so if they've got a damaged pelvis damaged tail damaged spine um that can cause problems with them actually just physically kind of taking the position to go to the toilet and and kind of squatting down to go for a pee is um you you know very important for a cat that will um kind of help trigger their their urination uh and, and emptying of their bladder if they can't assume that position then they may hold on for an awful lot longer than they would or clearly if they're in pain for whatever reason then they're going to hold on for an awful lot longer so um yeah all that said cystitis so inflammation of the bladder is really by far and away the most common cause of a bladder obstruction And this bladder inflammation is typically related to stress. Now, not every stressed cat is going to develop cystitis. Um, They're not going to develop an inflammation of their bladder and they're not going to become obstructed. Like I say, this is actually generally a male cat thing. The obstruction, that is, not the cystitis. But there also needs to be some kind of underlying um, predisposition to developing this obstruction. Now, that's likely to be a genetic problem, but it's not a condition that we completely understand. It's kind of quite similar to like an interstitial cystitis in people although there are differences and yeah there's a lot that we don't know but it might be that in the future we're better able to predict those cats that are at risk but by and large like I say there generally is an underlying stressor that results in an event like this happening and then that leads to them becoming blocked so there's a number of different things we can do to to prevent this from being a future 
a future problem in this cat that's going to reduce the likelihood, the frequency of flare-ups and reduce the severity of flare-ups. And so those things are going to combine to reduce the risk of this cat from re-obstructing. So we really want to be reducing the stress in any cat who has had bladder problems in the past. So um, stressors can include things like um, just multiple cats in the house. Uh, it can be, include things like competition for resources. So especially when there are lots of cats in the house, um, if there aren't enough food bowls or water bowls or litter trays or they're in the wrong place, then that can cause an awful lot of stress as they're kind of vying for these limited resources. Being confined inside and being trapped inside, that can even be just because of really bad weather can trigger a cat. Going for long periods without owner's company or in having actually the opposite, having interaction forced on them can stress a cat. Having strange cats coming into a cat's house is incredibly stressful. And that is actually a really common um, problem that I hear um, with my patients in the vet clinic uh, and again, can be a common trigger for cystitis. Also, if you've got building work, if you're renovating, if you've got visitors coming to stay, if you've got a new baby in the house, those can all be big stressors. So there's a number of different ways that we can try and reduce that. So the first one is the competition for resources. That's really the very first step that everyone should consider when there's more than one cat in the house. So as a general rule, the number of food bowls, water bowls and litter trays um, should be one more than the number of cats in the house. So if you've got two cats, there should be three food bowls. There should be three water bowls. Now, they can be next to each other and there should be three litter trays and the litter trays should be separate from the feeding stations because just like we don't like to eat our food in the bathroom our cats are, uh, are very similar so really um yeah we need to have that number but we also need to place them in the right spot so they should be out of high traffic areas so having uh, a food bowl or a litter tray right by the front door for example where everyone is coming and going there's a lot of foot traffic isn't the ideal place it should be in quiet places it should be in a private place but also ideally for a cat it should be in a place where they can kind of look out on the rest of the room they can see what's going on and they can't be kind of snuck up upon by the other cat so popping it in in the corner of the room is a really good place so they're they're protected from two sides and then they can survey the rest of the room um you know and make sure that they're kind of they're happy and they're they're doing their business by themselves uh without being kind of overlooked and the risk of being jumped out on so that's really important also making sure that you're the, the litter trays are being cleaned out promptly so some cats will just refuse to use a dirty tray they're going to hold on for an awful lot longer and so they're going to be more likely to de develop cystitis or if they do have a little bit of inflammation going on and they're holding on then there's going to be more of these deposits and debris building up within the bladder that's then more likely to cause this plug that's going to block everything uh you know using actually the right litter as well some cats are really fussy with the litter that you use so they might not like the the kind of the clay based litter which um clumps up and will maybe get stuck in their feet they might not like a scented litter as well cats can be very sensitive to smell so using just a plain wood chip or paper litter can be the best thing so other ways to reduce cat stress is 3D space. So cats are very three-dimensional in the way that they interact with their environment. You know, if you've got an outdoor cat, you'll often find them up a tree or or on the roof or, you know, wherever it is. But it's, you know, up and down. They're not just staying on the ground. They also love to sleep off the ground and they do like to have safe spaces, which I'll come on to in a little bit. But having a 3D space for your cat to climb um, and to explore is very important, as well as that's going to help uh, provide mental stimulation as well as physical exercise. And that's going to help them from becoming stopping them from becoming overweight and obese which is also a risk factor to developing a bladder obstruction so if you can keep them a nice slim condition then that's going to help prevent a, 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 another obstruction so like I say, safe places is really important as well. So cats do like to have somewhere they can retreat to that's enclosed, it's darker, it's quiet. So having somewhere that your cat can go and they always have access to, you know, it's not somewhere that's uh, in a room where you often have the door closed. And that could be on top of a wardrobe, it could be in a cupboard, um, it could be in a drawer. Uh, some For some cats, it's under the bed, Having a actually putting a bed for them under your bed or under the guest bed or something like that. That can really help a cat cope when they do have a stressful situation. 
So the next thing is to make sure that your house is secure. So like I say, with cats coming into the house, that's really common. You know, they they s- smell that food uh, and yeah, they could have burst their way through the cat flap if there's not if there's nothing stopping them. And yeah, that can really stress out your cat. As you can imagine, you wouldn't like it if a stranger just suddenly came into your house and started eating your food. Well, you know, it's the same for cats. Now, if you do have a cat flap, then there are a couple of more secure types. So you can get ones that uh, uh, um uh, magnet operated so they have a wear a big magnet around their collar that means that they can then open that cat door um, but any cat that doesn't have a magnet uh, yeah can't uh, a potentially more foolproof one because quite a few cats can have those magnets is to actually use a microchip cat flap now this is something that I did for my cats and uh, my cats were fed in the garage and there was a cat flap going in there and yeah a lot of the neighborhood cats were taking advantage of that so um, a microchip cat flap actually scans your cat's existing microchip if they don't have a microchip already it's a very simple thing for them to have uh, have implanted it's um, obviously done conscious it it takes um a few seconds it's not a big deal but it it scans their microchip and it will only let the cats who you program so all of your cats go through that cat flap there's no way that any other cats are going to be able to get through unless they are following them really closely because the door closes incredibly quickly and then once it's closed it's locked so that's um, really important as well um, and then another tip for, for helping cats to to be more relaxed and feel um, you know less stressed out in their home environment is to actually use uh, kind of some supplements to give them that little bit of extra help so fell away is one thing that I'll often recommend this is a pheromone supplement it it's the pheromone that cats release into the environment when they rub their cheek up against the furniture or your leg, that kind of thing. It's a way of them marking their home territory, marking their safe space. And Fellaway is great at this. It comes as a plug-in air freshener type diffuser and it also comes as a kind of little spray bottle. Now, the spray bottle is great if you're just spraying it on their bed. Um if that you know you could do that at home but it's especially good if you're t- when you're taking them to the vet um if you're taking them to the cattery you're putting them in their carry cage uh, a spray of fell away can really help reduce the stress of that situation um but the plug-in diffuser is great for using at home in their main the main room where they spend most of their time there are other supplements such as um zilkeen um or carmex and then there are pharmaceuticals as well which you can talk to your vet about if you know that they are particularly stressed so those are all the things that we could do to help reduce the the kind of stress and so reduce the risk of a recurrence of this bladder obstruction now other things we can do is we can actually feed them a a special prescription diet so we know that there are prescription diets that will significantly reduce the frequency and the severity of the flare-up so that's definitely something to consider and and it's something that i recommend to all of my patients who who have this problem suffer this problem now it can come in it does come in a wet form which is going to be the ideal form because as i come on to the other way to uh, help reduce this problem with blocked bladders and and um, cystitis is to get your cat to drink more water so feeding a a wet diet is going to be ideal but it also comes as a dry diet uh, a biscuit which has the same uh, the same proven benefit to reduce the the frequency and severity of flare-ups with cystitis but yeah we then want to try and increase our cat's water intake. Now, that in itself isn't actually going to reduce the frequency of the cystitis episodes, but it's going to have a flushing effect of the bladder. And so you're definitely much less likely to get an obstruction if a cat is producing dilute urine because they're taking in a lot of water. So um, using a shallow bowl for cats is really important. So cats will often not drink if their whiskers are touching the side. So using a wide shallow bowl is great. Experimenting with different bowl materials is also important so cats have a very sensitive palate and they might prefer plastic um, or more likely they're probably going to prefer um, glass or china they may prefer metal but that often gives a, the water a taste so just um, yeah, experimenting with different bowl types and actually you can try also adding some flavor so that could be a little bit of dilute tuna juice it could be um, boiling up a little bit of chicken um, and using the water adding a bit of water that to give that a little bit of a flavor that's going to encourage them to drink more 
another great way to get a cat to drink more is to actually use a cat water fountain. So a lot of cats will actually love to drink from running water. So it might be that actually your cat, um, you know, likes it when you turn the tap on, they'll they'll drink from the tap. But having a cat water fountain is a great way of providing that to your cat all the time without wasting loads of water and without having to be constantly turning the tap on and off for your cat. So, um, you know, those are some suggestions. And then the final one would be just to add some extra water to your cat's food, be that the prescription diet or or be that the, you know, whatever food you decide to feed them on. Now, some cats, they're not going to eat their food if you add too much water or even any water. But if you just slowly increase the amount of water that you add, you're going to get them more used to more, more used to that, more accustomed to, to eating that. And so that's a great way of actually providing more water um, and getting them to drink more. So taking all those steps, reducing the stress, um, changing the diet, increasing the water intake should really reduce the frequency, the severity of the cystitis episodes and really reduce the likelihood of a repeat obstruction from happening. So I hope that helps. Um, with that question and definitely gives you some actionable tips that you can take with your own cat if they're suffering from a similar problem. And then speaking of stress and problem peeing, so be that cystitis or spraying, I just wanted to let you know that this podcast episode today is brought to you by my free guides to stress in cats and also my guides to problem peeing in cats. So if your cat is suffering from any of these issues, if that you think they might be stressed and you're just not sure if you're wanting to tackle their stress before it becomes a problem, before they develop cystitis, or if they do have a problem uh, with cystitis, or if they're spraying and they're marking because of their stress, then head over to ourpetshealth.com slash resources, sign up to the Knowledge Vault and get access to all my free resources, including those guides. Get your questions answered at callthevet.org. And then my last question is from Ruben, who writes, My male chihuahua has recently cut down on his appetite and seems as if he's in pain. He has a hard time going to sleep, which is unusual for him because he's usually fast asleep in no time. I kind of rub his stomach a bit and it feels hard or bloated. So what could be going on with Ruben's chihuahua? Well, the first thing to say is that pain is best not ignored. So, you know, if you do have a concern that your dog or your cat is in pain for any reason, then getting them checked over um, as soon as possible is always going to be the best thing to do because, um, you know, pain can be a sign of a really serious condition. And even if it's a more minor condition, it's not fair to let your your pet suffer in, in pain and in pain that's not being treated. So, the first thing to consider is what could be causing a hard, enlarged or bloated stomach. Well, actually, it could be due to a number of different things. And unfortunately, just with that description, uh, you know, there's no way that I'm going to be able to narrow it down um, to one of these being more likely. It's going to depend on, you know, a lot of other things, you know, what's going on with, um, you know, with his appetite, any vomiting or diarrhea? Is he losing weight? Is he an older dog? Is he a young dog? You know, there's lots of different things involved that could make certain conditions more likely, certainly more likely on paper but even then you know it's going to need this um this wee dog is going to need an examination and you know some investigations but what could be the main problems um so abdominal pain can be caused by lots of different things now the most common things are uh, something like pancreatitis and inflammation of the pancreas that is um you know really painful now dogs will often be kind of very tense in their tummy so if you feel their tummy they're not going to be happy they're going to be very tense and they're going to be wincing if you put any pressure on uh with 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 um, pancreatitis, a common position they adopt with that pain that's actually in the front of their tummy is they'll they'll adopt something called a praying position where they'll stretch their front legs forward, they'll put their head and their chest quite close to the ground and they'll kind of stand up in their back legs. So if you imagine that's actually stretching out their tummy and that, um, you know, that's a sign of pain in their abdomen but is quite common um, in dogs with pancreatitis. Um Abdominal pain can also be due to a foreign body. So they've eaten something that's, you know, maybe slowly working its way through the guts or it's actually become stuck within the intestines causing problems. So that could be bone. It could be a toy. Um, it could be, you know, anything that they've eaten, um, you know, some socks or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, stomach cramping can be another cause of abdominal pain. And, and you know, that's something that's going to be maybe less severe. They've just got a bit of an, a tummy upset, but it's um, yeah kind of causing cramping. They've maybe got a bit of gas moving that's stretching the stretching the intestines and causing that pain. Now, 
what else can cause a hard and enlarged or bloated stomach well a growing mass has got to be on the list as well so certainly for an older dog if they've got a tumor and sometimes tumors can get really big before they actually start to cause a noticeable problem and that could be a liver tumor a tumor on the spleen um, you know a kidney tumor maybe although that's maybe less likely to cause uh, an abdominal distension an enlarged abdomen but certainly can cause a lot of abdominal pain as well so a tumor's got to be on the list especially for an older dog although younger dogs can't you can't rule that out just because of their age now fluid buildup is another reason that you can get a an enlarged a bloated abdomen and you can get fluid buildup for a number of reasons. Now, the most common ones are going to be um, liver failure. So the the liver produces um, is the main kind of way where the main place where proteins are produced. The protein albumin is produced, and albumin is uh, kind of circulating in the blood and is responsible for keeping a lot of um, kind of the fluid within the blood. Now, if the albumin levels fall, um, then a lot of fluid will leak out of the blood vessels and will often then leak into the abdomen. So that's one cause. And then heart failure is another cause of getting fluid building up in the the abdomen. So heart failure can cause fluid to leak out into the lungs, which will cause problems breathing. But yeah, it can also cause fluid building, leaking out into the the abdomen, which can cause that to become um, kind of really enlarged and kind of develop a real pot belly. And then kind of going back to cancer, some cancers can cause fluid buildup, uh, really, especially if they are, um, yeah, they can kind of cause leaky fluid, but also they can um, result in bleeding within the abdomen. So you get a lot of actually blood, that fluid that's building up is blood. So bleeding into the abdomen is the next cause. Now that, like I say, can be tumours, it can be because there's a bleeding problem, a clotting problem. So the the normal clotting processes aren't working. And the most common reason for that is going to be a rat bait. So rat bait can cause a number of different problems. But for example, if you've got a dog with a really enlarged belly, if they're looking really, you know, really quite bad, and if they've got really pale gums, then that would suggest that they're bleeding into their abdomen and rat bait's going to be on the list. If they're a larger breed dog, then actually a splenic tumour is going to be more likely. But Either way, as you can see, there's a lot of different causes that could be going on in this little chihuahua. Um, and all of those different causes are going to need different treatments and need different investigations. So what investigations might be needed? Well, a physical examination is going to be the first thing and can sometimes give us a lot of information along with that history. So a physical exam and a history, an accurate history, is really important no matter what problem your pet is suffering from. Um, you know, the importance shouldn't be underestimated. So that's the first thing that needs to happen. You know, the next things, depending on what's found, might be an ultrasound examination. It might be x-rays. Um, it could be blood tests. There's a lot of different things that we can do. And then really treatment is going to depend on what the underlying problem is, as you can see. If, um, you know, there's pancreatitis, for example, or if there's cramping, then medical treatment might be all that's needed. Um, fluid therapy, some pain relief. If there's a foreign body that's been stuck, a bit of bone that's been stuck, then surgery might be needed. If there's a tumour, then it might be that that needs to be sampled to start with and then chemotherapy might be in order you know there's lots of different things that could be going on heart failure again we need to start treatment for that i mean that may be may be able to um you know if not cure the problem actually get everything under control at least so either way it's really important in this case um with ruben's chihuahua that he takes it to the vet but you know it's a good uh, example of why um you know kind of searching online for advice is really um challenging and is sometimes really not the best thing that you could be doing because there's so many different things that could be going on and unfortunately depending on where you ask people will often come up with answers and say well it must be x y or z when re in reality there's absolutely no way that they can know that and by trying to do kind of give one course of action by trying to give some treatments without knowing what the problem is you're actually wasting your time you're wasting your money um, you're causing your dog potentially unnecessary suffering and you may actually be having an impact on how well they're then able to recover and how well they're able to be treated when you do eventually take them to the vet so that's always a really important consideration and it's also why i say in all of these podcast episodes that if you do have a problem um if your dog's unwell if they're injured um or if they're you know have you got you've got otherwise any problems or concerns with them also with your cat of course then you should be kind of talking to your vet in the first instance and so on that note, that's it for this episode of the podcast. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took some took some useful kind of actionable steps away um, or it will help you in the future if you're 
pet does have any of the problems that I've been talking about. If you do enjoy these shows, remember to subscribe so that you don't miss out on future episodes. And like I said at the beginning, if you do have a couple of spare minutes, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes or over at ourpetshealth.com slash review just to help more people discover this podcast. And if leaving reviews and I'm heading over to sites is not your thing, then actually just sharing this podcast episode with a couple of your pets owning friends will also be massively appreciated. So anyway, that's it from me. Um, And until next week, I'm Dr. Alex, and this is the Call the Vet podcast. And until next time, take care. You've been listening to Call the Vet. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of the show that answers all of your pet questions.